Welcome back to another episode of the Inner Fight Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Tom Walker. Man, how are you? Good, thank you. Very good. Thank you for coming on the show today. Today, we're going to be talking about aerobic capacity and its application in CrossFit. Before we dive into that, let's just go over the term engine, because that's a term that I've heard so many times, I've used many times myself and probably misused a little bit too many times. How would you define engine for a CrossFit athlete? I would define uh, I would define it as the amount of uh, volume, stress, uh, total endurance that the CrossFit athlete can do. So um, whether you define that in a day, week, month, year, it's it's if you've got a larger engine, you'll be able to handle more stress basically on on the body. Yeah. So basically, your your capacity. One thing for me that's you know. I think I have been misusing or misunderstanding about capacity and engine for CrossFit athletes is that movement economy and movement efficiency is a huge thing as well. Like I used to be or I've been pretty decent on a rower, for example, for a 5K row. But as soon as I have to do a workout as, you know, in the same time frame with thrusters and burpees, I wouldn't at all be able to express that capacity. So we had to kind of go back and look. And the first couple of years, I always thought, you know, I just need to row and bike more because my capacity is not good enough. My engine is not good enough. But really, my thrusters were super inefficient as well as for my burpees. And just fixing that little thing, which was pretty effortless, fixed so much. So I think in many, many cases, it's really important that if you are judging your performance based on engine, that you take two principles or two things into consideration one being your capacity which was what you spoke about and the movement economy so how efficiently you can move throughout those movements that you're challenged in because in crossfit to be honest we're challenged in so many different ways and domains and complexes and it, it's 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 very difficult to define you know someone's engine yeah yeah definitely like because someone coming from an endurance sport, you might say has a huge engine, yeah. often referred to as like diesel engines. They can do five, six, seven hour rides. doesn't touch them. Yeah. Put them in a CrossFit workout and it's chaos. Direct. Yeah. So like it's just a very broad term that a lot of people use for basically endurance. Yeah. But the main thing we want to do with this podcast today is to explain how aerobic capacity training that we see typically from the endurance sports, sports and, you know, your side of things how that can be applicable for CrossFit athletes and how they can structure it into their training and how they can use it to improve their overall fitness as in CrossFit fitness. Yeah, yeah. First, before we do that, we want to define what is the aerobic system and what does it do? Yeah, so it's made up of a few things, but essentially to take it through a, a simplistic journey, it's uh, it's from the time that you start to breathe oxygen in. Yeah. Uh, how the oxygen is brought into the body, where it's you know brought through to be uh, to oxygen to be delivered into it, which is into the lungs, which then gets transferred off around the body, and then the the waste product, carbon dioxide, and the other uh, waste products of the of the cycle get put back out. So through how you breathe or yeah. back into the uh, into the waste system of the body. So it's all a large process. Yeah. Um, and as you get better at endurance, essentially you just become more efficient at delivering oxygen into the muscles yeah. of the body. So, so it's the it's our way to deliver energy using oxygen. Whereas in CrossFit, often and sometimes, I mean, we're mainly doing anaerobic stuff when we're doing those short workouts. But the aerobic system is always working at all times, unless you're in a very very short 10 second sprint, basically. Yeah, so the energy system is, your body is always, the muscles feed off ATP, so that's always yeah. has to be generated, and it's how that ATP is made. So it's either through uh, oxygen, yeah. glycogen, or through pure ATP, and obviously they all get reestablished over different periods of time, which is why you can't go purely glycotic for over like, you know, six, three, four, five, six minutes. Yeah. Um, you have to use some of the oxygen uh, system as well, which is why aerobic capacity, what we're going to talk about today, is so key for all sports. Yeah. Unless you play a sport that is literally, you know, a minute long, which you might say 
maybe some of the power sports. Yeah, some of the Olympic javelin, sports. Shot put, yeah. something like that. Weightlifting. Yeah. Uh, but then their total training time will be dampened if they haven't got the ability to take on more load and stress. Which is one thing that's super cool about having that aerobic capacity is that yeah. the bigger that base is, the be- more you volume you'll be able to recover uh, to handle and the more volume the more training you'll be able to recover from exactly and that's you know from event to event from day to day from week to week and throughout the year yeah exactly so how do we develop this aerobic engine well yeah it's a really good question a lot of people have different ways of attacking it uh, a lot of people have come up with different systems or renamed other systems yeah to come out with reinvent theirs. the wheel or reinvented the wheel um essentially like with most things in the body how we get adaptation is you create a different stress a different stimulus for the body so i think a lot of the successful crossfit guys from what i know did endurance sports when they were younger so they might be uh have been swimmers or track athletes uh not many cyclists in there but they would have done a sport that was prolonged over a, a longer duration than normal like so for example, swimmers, they spend like six hours a day in the pool. Yeah. Um, Brent Fukowski, one of the best crossfitters in the world, is a former swimmer. And you definitely ride with the endurance part. Um, but there's definitely a lot of people who also didn't come from that kind of background. But we, c- the reason why they can still be the best is because they didn't need to develop all of the other things in yeah. the meantime. But Even then on like a college football program, yeah. they're going to be doing insane fitness in the off-season. Um, if anything, like the rugby seasons in the UK, they take a dedicated like two month block of of pure like there's no skills, there's no rugby involved. It's fitness. Yeah. And if you've got that two months from the age of probably they start preseason now with kids like down at 11, say up yeah. to up to youth and then into seniors, like that's a huge amount of time to be exposed to uh, endurance training that other people who might have just Start. not played sport or start starting fresh into CrossFit haven't had so there is a big big advantage yeah. and it's it's that time it's taken for it to come so you see it in endurance sports now like a lot of guys reach their peak when they're hitting like late 20s early 30s and even some into like their late 30s and you can almost start to predict where they're going to hit their endurance peak yeah. because it it takes such a time to build you can be like right five six years down the line Mm. This is where they're going to be at the point. Like the Grand Tour riders, for example, of the Tour de France. Yeah. Insane mileage every day. Like it's an incredible amount of stress put through the body. Yeah. You you cannot get a young guy coming in off off the the young squads coming through. He he's just never going to win. He might have a really good week, but then the guys who have just like you know your Chris Froome's, your Tom Dumoulin's, they've got that even bigger base that can carry them through to like the final week the final days and everyone else is absolutely smoked and they're still still going on and that is, to me is a very good sign of what endurance is the different roles that different people play yeah. in the cycling teams helps you to really understand it like the shorter the power guys they tend to be the younger ones they have more like they've less time to grow endurance but they're younger so they can handle more like high velocity stuff so for example like the the higher like muscular force so they might be better sprinters or um domestiques for like the, mm. the short sharper to look after attacks and things yeah but they haven't got that deeper base that the guys who are winning the three-week tours have got and i think that's kind of like a nice way of looking at it within so it basically as well comes down to a little bit like your training age you can yeah. you know if you're a coach and you take a client on you know you kind of really have to do your research on how far they are in their training journey in order to predict when this person will peak for that particular sport exactly so when we're looking at it with with crossfit guys is like how do we how do we build that quickly well it's it's not how do we build it quickly it's how do we keep you training it consistently Mm. like how do we stop you getting bored how do we create a new stimulus for that aerobic system yeah so and that can be done through uh, aerobic intervals yeah it can be done through long slow duration training it can be done through speed focus training it can be done through heart rate focus training it can be done through like fun like a we can you can have a week of like really unstructured hiking or something like that um so it's it's constantly having uh like tools in the bag that all build aerobic foundation but means that you're going to be consistent there's no one special thing no that's what i'm saying 
So let's take a look at a little bit more specific example. If we have a CrossFit athlete that is has the desire to compete in yeah. CrossFit, knows all the skills, pretty decent level, wants to compete at a higher level competition, but clearly lacks the foundation and the base, you know, aerobic base that we've speak, spoken about. How would you go about, you know, adding that aerobic base to this person's training volume? I think you'd have to look at a breakdown of their week. Yeah. Look at their background as an athlete. So if we say this person... It's a former gymnast. It's a former gymnast, has done no aerobic stuff. No aerobic but stuff. But is amazing at gymnastics and body weight stuff. So they're probably not a runner. No. Uh, they probably wouldn't have... But they'd have good balance being a gymnast, but you know, you'd look at something in the most simplistic form for them. So everyone thinks running would be the best way. Um, but you're then going to add in issues like uh, like running issues, basically. So we're looking at overuse injuries. We're looking at poor running technique. It adds in a whole other skill you have to learn, which they should know in CrossFit anyway. Yeah. But So what can we do that is going to be minimal... Um, like cognitive stress or learning demand with maximal aerobic output. And that might look something like three weeks of just establishing like what a comfortable base aerobic zone feels like. Yep. So teaching them what, like how to use a heart rate monitor, what we're looking for within that, how does that feel? So one day if your heart rate monitor like doesn't work, you can know like how it should feel. And which heart rate are we working at when we're speaking aerobically? You would define it as if you're looking at lactic threshold heart rate and you know what that is. Okay. You'd, you'd go how do you define that? You you can do a test. So that's like the heart rate that you would hold at your what they call lactic threshold, um, which is the sign of the line between when you're going between aerobic and anaerobic. And that's a simple test. You can do a 30-minute um, a run test or a 30-minute bike test. Yep. Uh, you can do it on a row as well, really. You can do it anything that gets your heart rate running, but it would only be applicable to that sports so if someone was wants to know their heart rate zones for the bike you'd get them to do the test on the bike but i assume it would be it would also be have have to be something where there's not a lot of um let's say it it can be a high technical movement and it can no. be something that's very that can fatigue you muscularly before it fatigues your energy system wise sort of oh, i mean if you put yeah. somebody on a it would probably work better putting somebody on a bike than doing 30 minutes of burpees. Yes. Because yeah, 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 yeah. we'll, we'll see tricep fatigue or whatever pressing fatigue before we'll get to our actual, you know, heart rate max or threshold. Yeah, you want to single out the aerobic system yeah. as much as possible or the energy systems as much as possible. So, like, bike or run are the common, <laughs> common ones. You'd get them to do uh, a, a good warm-up, like a substantial warm-up, and then they'd go into a 30-minute block. And uh, it would be an all-out effort. But obviously, you can't go straight into the red in a in a 30-minute block. You don't want to see a huge drop-off. So you say, no. look, you're going into the 30 minutes. Start off, you know, just over steady and then hold it. Yeah. And, and hold that line. It hurts, but you're going to have to hold it for 30 minutes. And then you take the last 20 minutes of that. And that would give you the lactate threshold heart rate, the average heart rate in the last 20 minutes. Yeah. From that number, you can then pretty much say, Okay, from the, from this number down, so say that number's 170. Yeah. From 170 down, we're looking at predominantly aerobic. Now, at 90%, you're still working, you're still going to be using uh, anaerobic a little bit, but not as much um, as if you're doing it at... Uh, so 90% you're still using a bit of anaerobic because it's never one or the other. But then the lower you go down that percentage, the more into the aerobic yeah. base you're getting. But you want to find the point where you're not just doing it as useless. So that would be around 50% would be the minimal, yep. up to around 65 to 70% would be the maximal aerobic time we'd want to spend in that heart rate zone yep. to get the maximum benefit out of it. A few intervals type stuff work above it, and then you recover underneath it. And that generally totals the time. The way that works is you get a prolonged uh, oxygen consumption post-exercise, so called EPOC. Um, and that's absolutely fine if you are getting enough intervals in yeah. and it's still a stress onto the body. Um, and what I mean by that is, so this is where like muscular 
muscular endurance capacity might come back into it is if you can run uh, 400s all day without going too far above your lactate threshold, yeah, that would be very different stimulus to someone who runs 400 and goes way above it, and then ability to recover, to yeah, recover, yeah. So the person who goes way above it will get more of an epoch benefit than the one who can just run and just go up, just go over it and come back down. Uh, that person, you may, might say to them, you're going to benefit more from doing long, steady state. So, How long are we talking when we speak about long, steady state? Is that anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes or are we all the way above 60 to 90 minutes, 120? I think uh, <coughs> if you're doing shorter stuff, so say you're doing 30 minutes, you need to incorporate more into your week. So you might do four blocks of 30 minutes, a total two hours. Yeah. Um, Will that still give the same benefit as just doing one two-hour block? It would if you're doing 30 minutes and then post 30 minutes, you can't keep your heart rate down. Okay. Yeah, but if you can do, say, two hours and hold your aerobic zone for two hours, then you're going to get a lot more benefit there. So we can look at a higher level athlete would be able to, it would make more sense to try to get these people to do longer, like 90 minutes-ish, intervals or not intervals but blocks versus the more neo crossfitter that we were t speaking about only make doing like four sets of you know 30 minutes throughout that week yeah you also can look at event time so i don't know what, what would a normal crossfit event time take i mean in, in qualifiers the average event time would be around 10 minutes and in a competition it can vary very much but it would never be it would rarely be over 30. But the workouts Very make rarely. up the event, right? Or is yeah, a workout is one event. Ah, okay, so what? how many workouts in a day? Uh, typically three to four over two to three days. Over two so to three we're days. talking like eight to 12 events. So total time of working out in a day would be? Maybe up to one hour max. So and now that would, that would actually be max. Like let's say, let's more or less say 30 minutes. So for CrossFitters, I'd want to see their aerobic training, take them up to maximum double that okay. so so it would be two hours i'd like to see you comfortably a be able to ride a bike or or run trek hike for two hours without going absolutely way above your your aerobic threshold yeah um, and that you would then say that person has a pretty good base foundation how many times a week could a crossfitter or let's just say an endurance athlete apply these principles i mean in crossfit we have to develop so many other things in the meantime and that's yeah. why I think a lot of people are confused and that's why we're trying to do this show in order to, you know, clarify how how we can apply these aerobic capacity sessions into our already super busy schedule where we have to, you know, get super strong, improve our gymnastics, skills, all those kind of things. Yeah. And then in the meantime, also develop a mass aerobic base. I guess you can sort of look at, you know, if you have a, a new, a fairly new CrossFitter or, you know, a CrossFitter that is wishing to compete that we can look at like a five-year template for this person if they're really dedicated and say all right for the next two years you know we're only going to focus on aerobic development and you know maybe maximal strength and then later on we can you know change that focus because it'll, it'll be hard in one week to fit every single thing in yeah. Yeah, also because yeah. the adaptations from strength and adaptation from aerobic capacity are sort of not the same. The conflicting, which is what we spoke about before in, yeah. the, in the podcast we did a few months ago. Exactly. So yeah, yeah I mean, from a five-year template, that'd be so good to sit down with someone who want who wanted to do that. Um, yeah. And I'd probably say <coughs> that you'd you'd look at at least the first two years to have a, a big emphasis on aerobic capacity. Okay, so if we have an athlete that when we, we speak aerobic, you know, we're below that. 65 to 70 percent that's what we agreed on yeah some from 50 yeah. to 65 um and we could put an athlete through two three sessions a week how many times a week would it require to see like proper progress throughout let's say a three-month block yeah well the, the more untrained you are the more the, ha the quicker the progress you're going to see yeah um the more trained you are the more you might have to think a little bit more about periodizing yeah. things so being able to add in more stress at times where other stresses aren't so much on the body to to spike a reaction to the aerobic training 
Um, and you want to essentially build them to a point where they be able to, after say <laughs> two, two and a half years, they could do like one hard aerobic session and not hard as in like go too hard on it, but one longer aerobic session in their week. And the rest can be brought around through like interval training or even just in their lifestyle. So like commuting to work on a bike or, yeah. or uh, using their active recovery days because they've got that larger aerobic base, they can meet, that means they can have an, a, a true active recovery day, which a lot of people in quotation marks have active recovery, but yeah. they're not actually recovering. They're still working yeah. hard from it. Whereas uh, someone with a, a good endurance base, a, a good overall ability to take on, on stress through exercise can have an active recovery day as, as it properly should be. Um, so the, the more they get into the journey of it, the more you'd want to basically take away the need to train it so much. Yeah. Okay. Just back to active recovery days. I think this is where heart rate monitor really comes into play, especially for CrossFitters, is that you can really use that heart rate monitor during your active recovery days. If you're at that level we spoke about to keep you under that, you know, under that max effort so that you yeah. don't get carried away because it's so easy. I know it for myself to all of a sudden start like going a little bit harder or like, you know, just pushing because you're getting bored. And yeah. and one way to get out of the boredom is, you know, to start pushing. And we, we like that feeling of being out of breath. And like you said, it can almost feel like a waste of time. You sit on a bike for 40 minutes at a low heart rate. Like it, it's just boring. But the fact is you need it. Like it's yeah. going to flush your body. It's going to help that aerobic development. And that's just necessary. CrossFit is a very good at being in the middle. Yeah. You know, very good at it. And let's let's talk about that because you know we've had this talk before and and you've mentioned uh, I've read many places that often you in order to improve that middle part you really just need to go really long and really short and that middle part will automatically improve. Yeah. You agree on that? Yeah. The middle the gray zone tempo zone 3 it's called many things. Um and people like either avoid it like the plague yeah. or they just get completely stuck in it. And my thoughts on it are, there's a definitely a time you need to have it. Um, and certainly building up to an event or a race, because that middle is where you're slightly uncomfortable, but not enough that you need to stop. But Which that's often the pace that you, sort of you'll be working at, right? Exactly. That's the pace you're going to run your 10K at, your half marathon at. Yeah, we can take you know? an example. I, I recently did a competition and we had to run 5.5K. That was actually one of my worst events at that competition. And I came back to you. I'm like, dude, I just got to run like it. So it was like a 22 minute workout or something like that. I just need to run 20 minute intervals, you know, like at that zone three, four that you're speaking about, which is like that threshold pace, basically. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. You need to run way longer at lower heart rate, like way, way longer. 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, etc. And then you need to do interval-based training that we do on our Track Tuesdays with the yeah. Interfight crew. Yeah. But what is the explanation behind that? Because I think, you know, in your head, you're like, I, it's like kind of like I want to improve my squat. I'm going to start squatting more. It's not always that simple. Yeah. Okay. So you want to run a 5K in 20 minutes. Yeah. So it's logic. Right. I'm going to go out and I'm going to run it four minutes per, per kilometer yeah. pace until I can hold that for 20 minutes. Yeah. And for someone... For one in a hundred, that might work. Yeah. And they're just like, yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run at that. Fine. My point to it is, and to, with you was, okay, to run that 5K, it's pretty fast. We're going to need some, some good speed work in it. You're going to need to enhance your muscular capacity to keep speed while under fatigue. Yeah. So that's where we need speed intervals. We need 200s, 400s, possibly up to eights, but two fours and sixes and you're going to have to hit those consistently in times so how do we get that more consistent times how do we show up like once twice a week and be able to get that speed well you've got to have the aerobic base there to handle it to handle the volume that you've also taken on through your other training so that's where the longer the lower intensity really easy running comes in view if you were to go out and try and hit that four minute per K pace, you would essentially just go down a really fast path to overtraining and fatigue because it's not easy. So your body has to have a recovery stimulus from it, but it's not so hard that it stops you after three minutes. 
Mm. It's 20 minutes at a hard pace. Yeah. So that's going to take probably around 24 hours to recover from. Within that 24 hours, you're probably doing other things that are stressing you. So when are you next going to do that workout? When are you going to be recovered enough to go and do it? And what if you don't hit it on that one? You, f- mm. you feel like you failed a day. Um, and that's not obviously the way to program. Like, no. It, it might work for one person out there, but why don't we teach you to go faster? Why don't we build your base to enable you to do those high, faster efforts in a more repeated time? And then, as we're getting up to the event, now we'll start cutting out away the, we call it like cutting the chaff, so cutting out the long aerobic stuff, cutting out the super high speed stuff of repetition. We'll still keep it in a little bit for a neuromuscular effect. Yeah. But now we'll start dialing in your pace. And suddenly, four minutes per K feels absolutely fine because you've been doing like really high intensity intervals more points in your week so you know what that true speed feels like yeah now we dial you back to four minutes per k we, we put you in that gray zone so you know where you're at how it feels and and your your body will adapt to it and that's actually the complete opposite of it today <laughs> i did eight eight hundreds at my 5k pace <laughs> 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 but um but you know it's super good point and and i think we all get confused and but when I think about it, it's the exact same when it comes to, let's say, gymnastics. We have an athlete that, you know, does a gymnastic-based event, doesn't finish very well, but only tries to develop gymnastics in Metcons. So, yeah. like, let's take a workout like Fran, a super easy workout, 21, super easy in the sense of explain, explaining it, not doing it. <laughs> Twenty-one fifty-nine thrusters and pull-ups. We have an athlete that couldn't do all the pull-ups and broken and they keep doing Fran in order to improve their pull-ups but really what they needed to do is maybe look at all right is it pulling fatigue what is it the technical stuff dial it back kind of like you you guys doing endurance is doing like just either skill work or in in the pull-up sense like we could work on just pulling capacity or actually improving the butterfly pull-ups so dialing it back and once you get back into those you know, Fran workout kind of types, you'll smash it, but you haven't had been doing the Fran workout itself. Exactly, but you've been exposed to more of the movements that you come yeah. across in Fran. And exactly. I've seen you guys do it, breaking down like the muscle up. Yeah. You'll, get, you'll have people do three weeks of, of uh, like ring rows and yeah, yeah. tricep work. And that's exactly how it is when looking at trying to run a, a f- uh, 20 minute 5K. Yeah. Um, same with triathlon. If, people you know if that logic was used in triathlon it would be okay well you're going to do a triathlon today and you're going to do it until you get fast enough to be good at it and then you're going to do the race and one of the things you said was you know overtraining because and and that's one of the key things it's not always the harder the better because no. you finish some let's say you did eight eight hundreds today like an idiot um <laughs> and you're super fatigued after but you felt like man i killed it today i crushed it but really that's not the adaptation you're looking for and maybe that that effort's gonna cost you. It's kind of like you have a you know piece of a cake, and and there's only so many pieces throughout the day. And if you spend half them already on the first session, there's not gonna be a lot left for session two and three, or for the remaining week. No. So you really have to be careful when you go anaerobic, when you go aerobic, yeah, exactly. and and really be smart about the programming. Is it hard to overtrain the aerobic system, like? If, if we have someone, I mean, if, if we have an athlete that, like, might not be ready for one hour at zone two, zone three, um, would that You'll be self-limit it. Okay. Yeah, you'll self-limit. Because if they're not ready for two hours of zone two, their body will let them know. Okay. So they'll either go, they'll go too far out of the range or their muscles will cramp up and stop. So it's not... You can get into a chronic fatigue state yeah. through through low aerobic training. How do you recognize if you're in that state? Uh, more subjective measures than anything. So looking at like uh, motivation levels, yeah. uh, appetite, yeah. your um, yeah, how you're sleeping. There's a few ways that you'd recognize it. Heart rate would be interesting to yeah. look at. Resting heart rate. I know you guys. Heart rate variability. Y- yeah, heart rate revel- variability, which is an application on your phone, which you can connect with your, you know, chest monitor and actually test every morning. Yeah. 
and after four days it gives you an average and then you can sort of use that average on a day-to-day -day basis to see exactly yeah um i think there's not many sort of as we call them weekend warriors or uh non-professional endurance athletes that can get themselves into a a real chronic fatigue state through pure base training no it's normally comes from the other side so yeah. going going too too hard or if they're professional and they're just spending day after day after day in that aerobic zone and not letting themselves recover or pushing themselves harder yeah so the message levels. here is basically don't be afraid doing too much aerobic stuff but rather you know be careful not doing too much of the anaerobic stuff the stuff where you know you're on the floor and you're 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 killed and you're done and yeah. you know you you can't you you're just completely wrecked and that's not what we're looking for so if you are coming here at inner fight five times a week you know you got to make sure that maybe not every day is a max effort day and and you have to be able to modify it from a day-to-day -day basis based on yeah. how you feel because stress doesn't only come from training the no. body gets stress from anything in life work relationship all of those things it puts the same stressors training does yeah it you know it all piles up so stress is stress yeah the other thing you see is people thinking um they've done too much aerobic base because they get they've come off a huge block of like high intensity work and they're they're fatigued in a fatigued state and then they find it hard to raise their heart rate yeah and then they think oh i'm i'm doing a lot of aerobic work and i'm getting really tired from it and it's like yeah you, you are and you are you're not wrong there but that's from off the back of all the high intensity work that you've done and not let yourself recover properly from it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, you're blaming the, the firefighters for showing up at the fire, <laughs> causing it. It's just because correlation and causation are two very different things. So I think that the biggest thing for people is, is to be able to fit it in around their day to day lives. I think it was a really good thing what you said about, you know, even just biking to work. Yeah. That can be aerobic, like hike in the weekend or, you know, in Dubai, you go to Hatta, you hike for you two hours. Like, that's aerobic base building it's without it's you knowing it. Like, yeah. at the best, it's hard in Dubai. Like, the clients here, you you sort of trying to find their week to get more zone two in mm. because you can't really cycle to work here. Yeah. You you don't walk outside as much. There's a lot less walking around. So, I think people get into the habit of of like one hour sessions because that's what a lot of classes run at is one hour. Yeah. So, they think more in that hour is better. Whereas my clients like in, in the UK or in Europe, they do bike to work and they do run to work. And it's actually like, okay, you're doing loads of base here. Yeah. Like let's actually get some actual quality into your, mm. into your schedule. So it, that is so dependent on where you are environment wise. Yeah. One way I know as that's kind of famous in CrossFit for developing aerobic base is using like an around the world kind of workout principle and that would be like a 30 to 90 minute EMOM with six different stations mm. where you could do some more sport specific stuff, something that's a bit more applicable to the sport, such as, you know, wall balls or double unders or easy rowing or lunges or s you keep it super low, low intensity and you keep it super lo low, low um, load, but you still are able to move for that long time but it's a bit more sport specific than sometimes sitting on a bike for 90 minutes and i think it's really important that you manage to, to you know also put that into your program and that can also be i mean through just if you do your aerobic stuff on a bike for a long period of time then you can slowly dial it into becoming a bit more sport specific yeah such as you know an imam for 60 to 90 minutes incorporating skills and that could be anything like Minute one, six pull-ups into 12 wall balls. Minute two, 45-second aerobic row. Minute three, eight kettlebell swings plus eight box jumps. Minute four, bike, et cetera, et cetera. Something yeah. simple. I, that would be really nice to see if, okay, you, you can now do 90 minutes on a bike aerobically, very yeah. easy. Uh, why can't you do a 90-minute around the world EMOM like what's the movement that caused you to, to have problems and yeah. it's a really good way to show weaknesses that's uh, true and, yeah. and highlight weaknesses to work on so yeah I love that idea it's very yeah. good it's, it's quite a, a an easy principle to use and but I think nobody kind of uses it simply because as soon as there's CrossFit elements in a workout people just want to hit it hard yeah and it's 
you know, like you said in the beginning, I think it's the difference between, you know, the best and the rest is they're willing to do what's boring and what's, you know, what doesn't seem like gives a great workout. Yeah, exactly. It, and it's very easy to kind of get confused with something with the workouts because it's not always how you're doing in the workout that kind of it doesn't need always need to be directly transferable it might be the adaptations from what you're doing that will be indirectly transferable over to that workout yeah. and that's what's so hard to grasp sometimes and that's exactly what the run like that's why i ran today eight eight hundreds at that 5k pace because i was mad that i wasn't good on that 5k and i wanted to put myself in that state that I was in for the 5k and try to push myself further but really I needed to think about you know no no how is this gonna be trans like what are the adaptations I get from this session that will make me smash that 5k in six months from now yeah yeah and if you looked at your probably your average heart rate from the 5k in the competition and your average heart rate from this morning I bet they match up pretty, pretty similar similarly. yeah um, but in the way you want to think of it is you're always working to a percentage of your maximum capacity so the most you can do you're always working back to a percentage of that yeah and if you limit yourself for the most you can do which in an 8800 you are they're like those intervals are long enough that you're that you're putting a limiter on it yeah uh you're not going to grow the super high end and to get to the high end to be able to repeat it you need the low end to be able to, to support it with the foundations yeah. it might only be a four-week block but uh you'd see a big big difference in it yeah I'm sure i think that's all for aerobic capacity application for crossfit athletes for today yeah. we're definitely gonna you know jump back on this topic once again in a, in a year or so and and with all the learnings crossfit is still a new sport and we, we still don't know the, the right or the wrong way and um and i'm excited to see how we much we'll know in one year from now and yeah. you know with your help and uh, with my coach help and how i will improve and how all the athletes on the endurance program and on the crossfit program will yeah that's really good, really good. If you guys want to learn more about these kind of topics and especially endurance side, you have to hop over to if underscore endurance on Instagram no, or just if endurance. endurance and Tom Walker Fitness yep. on Instagram. And you'll be able to find a lot of good content on endurance specific topics and they have some really cool projects running right now. Definitely hop over and check it out there. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thank, awesome. thank you.